in holiness. Who is like you? In the greatness of your majesty, who overthrew your adversaries. O Lord, awesome in splendor, who is like you? Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power, shattered the enemy. O Lord, worker of wonders, who is like you? Sing to the Lord my strength and my heart. You are my salvation. Let us pray. We sing and speak your praise, O God, grateful for the many ways in which you have healed us. Keep our hearts, our minds, and our spirits open to learn ways in which we can offer healing and love for others. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our opening hymn is a familiar tune, and it's found in Faith We Sing. And it's written specifically for our scripture for today. So let's stand and sing number 2234 uh, in our faith we sing. <laughs>
so good to see you here today. Uh, this story today is a very familiar story. And one of the challenges is to read it with new eyes. And I have to tell you, I ended up re-recording the sermon like seven times until yesterday I finally thought I got it right. Um, because we're so familiar with the text, and for those of us that are over, say, 50, we're so familiar with Cecil B. DeMille's movie, The Ten Commandments, that we glance over the text and we don't really read it with fresh eyes. And when I was reading it for the sermon this week, I saw something I had never seen before. And I, I just popped up, and, and it's really crucial to the story. And we have glossed over it. And uh, so you're, I'm trying to, to help. But uh, this is the fourth week in our uh, series on the book of Exodus. Uh, for if you haven't been here, you can go back and listen to the podcast or you can watch it on uh, Facebook or YouTube. Uh, but let me just give you a short synopsis. We began the first sermon with the story of the enslavement. There was a new pharaoh in Egypt and he was threatened by these foreign immigrants. And how did those foreign immigrants get there? They're descendants of Jacob's. They were the brothers and their wives and children of Joseph, who had saved the nation, saved the region, through a severe famine that came as a result of seven years of drought. But this particular king was so threatened by these immigrants that he wanted to destroy them. So he first enslaved them, put them to hard labor, making bricks and building new cities and monuments. And then he, uh, when that didn't curb their growth rate, he decided to have all male babies killed at birth uh, using the midwives. When that didn't work, then he ordered that all male Hebrew babies under two years of age will be thrown into the Nile River. And of course, out of that, we get the story of one little boy who had a brave mother that hid him for a few months and then put him in his own ark and put him in a tributary of the Nile where the king's daughter was known to bathe. And she saw him, took pity on him, uh, sent him back to his sister, to the mother. And once he was weaned, old enough, three or four, he would come and she would formally adopt him in the palace. The next week, we find a young man, Moses, who was royalty, probably talked like an Egyptian, looked like an Egyptian. So he had gone from Hebrew to royalty given a top-notch education, but he has pity on a Hebrew slave who is being beaten by an Egyptian. And instead of just stopping the Egyptian, he kills him, hides the body, and discovers the next day he's been found out. So now we go from Hebrew to royalty to murderer to fugitive. So when we get to the second week, he is in exile in Midian, and we find him on God's holy mountain, Horeb, where he has now become a shepherd. And God speaks to him through the burning bush, and God reaffirms that these are God's people that are enslaved in Egypt. And it's time to take them out of slavery and bring them back to the land God has promised. And God has picked Moses to lead this exodus. And if you recall, Moses gives five different excuses of why somebody he's not adequate and somebody else needs to go, and God sends him anyway. So last week, 
we find Moses going back to Egypt with his family. He meets up with his brother Aaron first, and they go to Pharaoh, and their first request is simply to allow the slaves three days off so they could go to Mount Horeb and worship their God. And we've got a new Pharaoh, and he is not threatened by these slaves at all. In fact, he likes having the Hebrews there. He likes having slaves, and they have put them to work, and they are now the major labor force in Egypt. And he is so insulted that they wanted three days off that he decides to uh, make their labor worse, put a new thing on them. And, of course, then we have Moses with his staff and the nine plagues. And we get to the tenth plague where Pharaoh has said no, 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 no. And we get to the tenth plague, which is what we looked at last week, where God gives very specific instructions that they are, each family, or a combination of families, are to sacrifice a year-old male lamb without blemish. And they're to do it together at twilight on a specific day. They're to roast it over an open fire. And they are to eat it packed and ready to go. With their loins girded, sandals on their feet, and a staff in their hand. They're taking the blood of that sacrifice and putting it on their door. And the angel of death at midnight would come through and pass over all the doors with the blood. But on those doors that do not have that mark, the firstborn of the family and of any animals would die. God also makes another demand. They are to never forget that night. From then on, on that anniversary, they are to retell their story to that children, to their grandchildren, to every generation. Must know that story. So now, today, we're going to look at a resurrection story. Now, we looked at a resurrection story just a month ago. We looked at our resurrection story, the resurrection of Jesus. And what we saw is Jesus telling his disciples, at least on three different occasions in the Gospel of Mark, that he would be rejected, he would be executed, and three days later he would come to return back to life. But they didn't listen to him. So what happens when he's arrested? They run, and they run out of fear because they just can't imagine anything but what they've always known. So, here's our story for today. And I could read you the scripture, but the scripture kind of um, uh, it duplicates itself. So, I just want to tell you the story. So it's twilight, and every Hebrew family has slaughtered their lamb. And even though they don't understand, they take the blood and they smear it on the post. And they roast that lamb over an open fire, just as God had instructed them. And while they're roasting it, they're packing their things. So that when they eat it, they have sandals on their feet, their loins are girded, their bags are packed, their staff is in their hand, and they're ready to go. At midnight, just as Moses said, the angel of death comes passing through. And nothing happens in their homes, just like nothing happened in their homes during the plagues. But suddenly you hear the wails and the cries of the deaths and other homes. 
And a little after midnight, Pharaoh relents, and he calls in Moses, and he calls in Aaron, and says, go, go, get out of here. Take all the Hebrews with you. I don't need this headache anymore. And because they're packed and ready to go, they begin gathering outside, and the Egyptians come out of their home, and they start giving them gifts. Precious metals, gold, silver. They start giving them jewels and fine cloth. Sending them on their way. Their path to the promised land would take them through the Sinai. Through the desert and through the wilderness. And they make it to what we call the Red Sea, but if you read in any Hebrew Bible, they call it the Sea of Reeds. And they're told to camp there. And before them is that pillar of fire that God promised them that leads them to where they need to go. And so they start setting up camp, the desert on one side and the sea on the other. And they see in the far distance chariots coming. Now here's what I think happened. I think as soon as they cleared out of town, and it's the next day, the Egyptians stood around and said, who's going to do the work around here? Who's going to make the bricks? Who's going to build the buildings? Who's going to tend to the sheep? Who's going to take care of the cows? Who, are, who is going to farm? And they all start complaining to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh goes, well, let's go get them. And so he sends his armies out, his chariots, out to bring them back. And here's the Israelites with the sea on one side. And they can see from the far distance the chariots coming. And what do they do? They turn on Moses, as you would expect them to do. So I want to read just this part because it's really good. They said to Moses, weren't there enough graves in Egypt that you took us away to die in the desert? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt like this? Didn't we tell you the same thing in Egypt? Leave us alone. Let us work for the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to work for the Egyptians than to die in the desert. And here's Moses' wonderful reply. Don't be afraid. Stand your ground. Watch the Lord rescue you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You just keep still. What I have missed all these years is God's response. And here's what God says. Why do you cry out to me? Tell the Israelites to get moving. As for you, lift up your shepherd's rod, stretch out your hand over the sea, and split it in two so that the Israelites can go into the sea on dry ground. In other words, God's saying, I am not your quarterback. I am not your point guard. I am not your pitcher. I'm your coach. I've given you what you need to get out of this situation. So lift up your staff, split the sea, and don't tell the Israelites to stand still. Tell them to get moving. And God's pillar of fire then goes from the front of the group to the back of the group. And when it goes to the back of the group, it appears like a cloud. So what the Egyptians see is darkness and fog. They can't see the Israelites anymore. They don't know where they're at. They don't even know where they are at. They can't see. But on the other side, because it's dark by now, the cloud gives light to the Israelites so they can see 
Moses lifting up his rod, and they can see the wind start blowing and the water start moving. And suddenly there is a dry path on the seabed. And we all remember, or those of us that have seen Cecil Billy DeMille's Ten Commandments, remember the jello on this side and the jello on this side. And the Israelites began walking across on dry ground. Just before dawn starts to break, the Israelites are almost to the other side. And God's pillar of fire moves again, goes back to the front of the line. And suddenly the Egyptians can see, and they can see that the Israelites are almost through the sea on dry land. So they go taking out after them. And as soon as they hit that seafloor, their wheels start to stick. And they can't turn their chariots. And they realize God's fighting for them. God's not fighting for us. Let's get out of here. But by then, the sun is coming up, and God tells Moses, stretch out your hand over the water. And just as the sun begins to rise in the sky, the sea goes back to normal. These men with their heavy armor and their chariots and their horses with their armor, they can't make it out. Not a single one of them makes it out. So, this is a resurrection story. But resurrection stories were not anything new in this time period. In Mesopotamia, they had a god named Tammuz. And he was a dying and rising God. Even the Egyptians had an entity called Set that was dismembered. And every year, Set, the pieces miraculously came back together and that God came back to life. Even the Canaanites in the Promised Land had Baal. And every spring, when the green grass started growing and the trees started budding and the newborn lambs were born, they would celebrate the resurrection of Baal. This is a resurrection story because on one side of that sea, we had a hopeless group of slaves who do nothing but a cruel Pharaoh, and they couldn't, they didn't have the imagination. And neither did Moses to think they could get out of this situation. But on the other side of that sea, they were God's people. They saw what God can do and they believed. But this isn't the end of the story because let's look at Jesus' disciples. They didn't believe when Jesus told them that he would be rejected and executed. They didn't believe him. And when that happened, they ran, and they ran out of fear. And even after they saw the empty tomb and the women told them he's risen, they didn't believe because they lacked the imagination. And even when Jesus appeared before them, they had a hard time believing. The same with the Israelites. They had heard Moses and Aaron. They had experienced those plagues, and they had seen that those plagues affected the Egyptians, but not them. They had escaped, just like Moses told them they would. But they panicked when they saw the army. And even Moses lacked imagination. Here he had this magic 
staff. And he stood there with it thinking God's going to do something to save us. And he didn't realize he had the power within his own hands. God had to tell him to wake up and use what I've given you. Get the sea moving, get the sea splitting. So those slaves can become my people. But even after the disciples realized who Jesus was resurrected, they didn't know what it meant, and just like the Hebrews who came to the other side and realized how powerful Jesus was, or how God, powerful God was, they didn't understand what it meant to live as people of faith. And there is absolutely no archaeological proof that the facts of this story actually happened just like it happened. No proof. But you don't need proof. The story is enough. Because this story has been passed down from generation to generation to generation to generation for almost 3,000 years. And that story has carried the chosen people of God, the Hebrew or the Jewish community, through exile, through persecution, through the Holocaust, through the diaspora. They still are telling that story just as we tell the story of Christ. But here, here's the thing. This story of hope has given hope to scores of people. It's given hope to oppressed slaves that one day they can gain their freedom. It has given hope to people under attack that one day they will get their freedom. The president of Ukraine is Jewish. He's heard this story over and over and over, and I bet that is one of the reasons he is able to stand up bravely and say, we will get through this. There is hope for our future. But it takes imagination to see it. We have a world right now that is acting like the slaves at the sea's edge. Fear has become an industry. And it has frozen us into believing that there is no future. And so we're wanting to go back. Go back. Go back. Remember when? It wasn't that good back then either. Because we lack the imagination to move forward. I want you to picture a better future. Not just a better future for you and your family, but look at this church. Pick a better future for it. Have the imagination to see our city of Camden have a better future. Have the imagination to see our state and our country still having a better future where we the people are united together in our diverse ways. Do we lack the imagination to see that? Because God's telling us that's what we need to do. God will be our coach, but we have to do the work. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
of this world, we are left in awe of this majesty. When we look upon the vastness of the oceans, the grandeur of your mountains, and the beauty of our deserts and bloom, we are aware of the holiness of all creation. We are surrounded by your glory and stunned by your splendor. But sometimes, O oh God, we feel lost in the majesty of all that surround us. We feel lost in the crowds and in the mass of humanity. We feel that our problems and struggles are insignificant when we measure it against the violence, injustice, oppression, and human tragedy that we read about and see on the evening news. We even feel that our prayers may get lost, O oh God, at the times when we need you most. It is then that we need the assurance of your presence. Just as you care about the simple sparrow and the one lost sheep, the lilies of the field, we trust that you care for us. And so this morning we offer ourselves to you as a possibility. Hold us as a tiny bud and encourage each new growth. Nurture us as fertile seeds that we might use all the potential you have given us to become a blessing to others. Grant us patience when we become impatient and frustrated when we seem to be going nowhere, when we find ourselves stumbling along blindly. Touch us where we are, O oh God. Where there is grief and sorrow, grant your comfort. Where there is illness and hurt, grant us healing. Where there is anger and hatred, grant us peace and reconciliation. Where there is fear and despair, grant us the confidence to face the future. Wherever we are, O oh God, give us a vision of hope and possibility. Enable us to live as your people, that we might be raised to a new awareness of the wonder and sacredness of all life. Transform us from frightened, hesitant, uncommitted followers into a people given meaning, hope, purpose, and a new direction through the risen Christ. Amen. Let us pray. 
pour out your blessing on those that are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make us one in your spirit, one in ministry with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until one day we gather in great celebration at your heavenly banquet. Now our glory, power, honor, and majesty is yours, now and forever. And now with boldness, let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. But lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Would those serving please come forward? children of God, come feast at God's table.
number 557, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. As we stand and sing together, if you have a decision you need to make for Christ, we invite you to make that today. Let us stand. Thank you. 